So I hope you can all see this now. You're seeing the screen that says design management PowerPoint presentation. Yep. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, let's launch into this thing then. Design management is a pretty big field and it is a proper uh, professional denomination, in fact. So you can be a design manager and that can be your job. And you could become that with the degree that you're getting now, a degree in industrial design. Um, there are actually study courses where you can take a whole degree in design management. So what I'm showing you here today is pretty much everything they would show you during a whole degree program. Uh, like for example, uh, there, there used to be the De Montfort University in Leicester in England, where you could take a design management master's degree within one year. And I think their curriculum includes everything I'm going to show you now within the next hour. So just sit back with a cup of coffee or tea and, uh, and just let it all happen. It's gonna be a lot of information and I'm going to do my best to explain it all as, as well as I can. Uh, do take notes if you like, if something interests you, we can take questions afterwards. So the first big question people tend to have about design management is what actually is design management? And there are a lot of different interpretations going around, most of which are wrong. So a lot of people are using the word design management very badly and aren't actually talking about what design management really is when they're using it. So some people are saying that it's the business side of design. Some people think design management is all about telling designers what to do as a manager. Then others are saying it's, it's about managing what happens when, when design has been done. And yet others say, oh, it's just about a way of doing management in a particularly beautiful way. <laughs> oh, clearly the last one is bollocks. So um, the other ones are slightly right, but the, the rightest one of these is that design management is about the business side of design. So it is a business discipline and it is understood as such by the business world. So if you're saying that you're a design manager, then it will be assumed that you know a lot about business practice. And what that is, I will show you today. Um, the reason why design management is actually in place is because someone will need to develop and maintain a business environment regarding design. So if you consider starting your own company, for example, uh, you will need to do all your own design management. Or if you're working at a company that has designers, uh, then somebody there will need to do the design management. It's used for a number of different things. The most important one being that an organization such as a company can achieve its strategic goals through design. And strategic goals could be something as simple as selling more or introducing a different line of products with some success, stuff like that. Uh, and we have already started doing that in our project here. We have started being strategic about the way a company is marketing a desk lamp because we know that this desk lamp is going to be perhaps used for uh, marketing purposes. It's a side product because none of these companies we're working with in our project habitually design desk lamps with the exception of IKEA, of course. So we have already started being strategic in our goals for this product. And then there's this side here, which we haven't actually talked much about yet at all. And that's about uh, managing an efficient and effective system at work. So in that regard, design management can absolutely mean managing designers. So this, this could mean that there is one person who leads the designers, making sure that the entire environment in which they work is 
getting stuff done, which would be efficient and uh, is effective, which also means using the means there are to the best possible end. So these are basically the three different ways in which design management fits into the working world. And that's, that's why it exists and what its purpose is. There are many different interpretations, like I said before, of what a design manager does and what design management is. And we see this uh, matrix here where different authors from design management as an academic area are listing what a design manager should be doing. And you can see here that they do not agree with each other at all. But there's another interesting thing happening and that is that when you look at the right column here, you see that these are authors that started writing quite early. So we have one that wrote in 1980, one that wrote in 1998, and then it gets later and later. And the later it gets in the writings of these authors about design management, the more design managers are actually expected to do. So I think it's safe to assume as of this date that if you're going to be a design manager, you are expected to deal with all of these six aspects, sorry, all of these five aspects here at the top of the matrix. So we are saying that a design manager as of today in the 21st century is going to be dealing with questions of strategy and purpose, which is pretty much about deciding how the product is going to be created, what for, uh, how it fits into the organization's role and so on. A design manager may very well also be involved in personnel and organization. So that means they will be the ones who sit on a panel when a designer is hired. Uh, they may manage a designer's progress through their career and so on. So they might be the boss of the designers. They will also somehow need to be the ones who build the bridge between the culture of the company they're working for and what the design world can do for them. They will do the project management and they will do a thing called practice and process. And that can mean a lot of things, but it pretty much means that they are guiding the design process and they may also very well be the ones who uh, create further education possibilities for their staff, for their designers. I have a red frame here around one of these authors. Her name is Borja de Mozota, that's Spanish. And she is the most recent person whose, whose word on what a design manager does is respected. So we can pretty much say what Borja de Mozota says about a design manager. Is, is truly what's still valid. No one has contested her since 2003. So uh, almost 20 years now, she has been right. And uh, we'll just quickly go through these bits. I've already talked about them, but Mosota says that a design manager is supposed to be involved in strategy and planning. So they would be the person who then sits, perhaps even uh, at the board of directors when the when the big guys are talking, if you will. Um, there is going to be finance involved. So they might do some bookkeeping. They might deal with budgets. Uh, they will need to decide who works on what in the team and if new designers need to be hired. They would also be the ones who interface with all the other instances of R&D as it's called. I hope you've heard that term before. R&D stands for research and development. And that is the cluster of activities that we designers are normally part of. But that also includes marketing and that also includes engineering and that includes the entire production setup. So all these people, they need to be talked to. And this is what the design manager is doing. Uh, the actual project management means that uh, we would be expected to be the ones who, who do, in fact, tell the designers what to do and when to do it and with what means. 
And then in the end, we are also the ones who evaluate what has been created. So when a prototype or a show car or a pre-production version of something um, is ready to be shown to the board of directors, it would be the design manager who makes that final evaluation before it's the big day and everybody pops the champagne corks and starts serving sandwiches to show the prototype to the director. Uh, that's when that design manager will go around and make sure everything is as it should be. Yep, and that makes her pretty much done. That's Borja de Mosota. I'm, I'm listing her here again because that is currently the most important author in design management. And if you are very interested in that subject and perhaps want to read up on it, or even consider doing a master's degree in it, I would uh, strongly recommend reading some of her work. Um, I'm going to interpret a little more about, uh, yeah, on, on the literature that she has written. She makes these four points here and I'm finding them very interesting. Um, so one is that Mosota says that the design manager is the one uh, who is dealing with the internal business processes of a company. And clearly that presumes that uh, this is a big company, not just a, a one man show or a one woman show, because there are such a thing as uh, internal business processes where you may pay a certain department to do certain things for you. It's perfectly viable that uh, at BMW, for example, the design department may actually pay the marketing department to do um, a market analysis for them or some such thing. So that's what the design manager does. Um, the design manager will also create learning and growing opportunities for staff, which means if, if, they, if there is a new software, for example, yeah, if uh, there is an auto studio, alias auto studio 12.0 has come out, well, the one who books in the training for the designers is the design manager. Um, strategic positioning of customer and brand is a thing the design manager is involved in. So that is where they sit at the big board, mostly with the marketing people, I assume, to decide what direction the new product is going to take and how it is going to be positioned on the market. And then there is this whole financial side in which um, we don't really have any direct influence, but we might answer for it. We might say, okay, due to the fact that uh, we have a very strong design department at this company, the company reputation is particularly strong. You can see that in the case of Macintosh, Apple, uh, they're famous for looking fantastic and that is much of what their image has been based on. And it means that the company's stock market performance is going to go up because of that. So if you're the design manager and you're sitting in one of those meetings, you might uh, point at how good it's been looking at Wall Street in the quarterly report. So we can basically summarize that these three things here are happening when design management is done. Um, you're aligning the design strategy that happens at the design department with the corporate strategy or the brand strategy. What we are saying with that is we're making sure that the designs are the, that, that the designs that are being created fit the company in every way. We're also managing the quality and consistency of the design outcomes as design managers. So we are the ones who manage the expectations at the, at the, the director's meetings, for example. We're saying, well, by Wednesday, we could have a clay model. And that clay model will be fifth scale. So one to five size. And then you go to your designers and you have a meeting and you say, this is what we're doing till Wednesday. And it's got to be perfect or not. <laughs> and then you have this whole long thing here about enhancing user experience, creating new solutions, differentiating from rivals. 
what this really means is that we're we are ensuring uh, that we're making a useful difference with our design this is something that is sometimes forgotten um, but when you're designing a new product of course it's going to have to be different and better than the previous ones and it's got to have some new solutions to current challenges and it's going to be a more interesting user experience than the current product and it's of course it has to be different from what your rivals do all that goes into that i've collected some yeah quotes if you will by some famous design management authors <clears throat> peter gorb is uh, one of those very famous people one of the one of the first to really do some uh, useful writing on design management and he had this very interesting paragraph to say i'll just read that out to you enjoy design management is the effective deployment by line managers of the design resources available to an organization in the pursuance of its corporate objectives it is therefore directly concerned with the organizational place of design with the identification with specific design disciplines which are relevant to the resolution of key management issues and with the training of managers to use design effectively wow i mean he, this is like this is two sentences and he basically puts a whole book into that and i think what this really says is just what i've printed down here in fact print it says that design management helps defend design within the company because the fact is that not everybody is our friend in industry we will always need to defend our decisions to the engineers to the marketing people to the uh, finance people everybody will ask us well why do you propose that and then somebody will need to speak up for it and if the company is biggish then uh, it won't be you, the designer itself, uh, who was expected to do that. But there's going to be the design manager who will then stand up and say, well, this is why we did this and so on. So that's what that's used for. We have another famous and interesting person here, John Thakara, who has also written interesting books on design management. And he said this. Design management is a complex and multifaceted activity that goes right to the heart of what a company is or does. It is not something susceptible to pat formulas, a few bullet points, or a manual. Every company's structure and internal culture is different. Design management is no exception. But the fact that every firm is different does not diminish the importance of managing design tightly and effectively. So another long and interesting blurb. And it basically says, in my opinion, that a managed design process will benefit any company. So that goes right against the theory that designers should be wild and free and do whatever they like, like they did at Google in the 1990s for a while, where they had uh, company couches and company aquarium and company dogs and things and people were just working whenever they like. So Fakara is of the opinion that if the design department is working professionally and is structured well, then the company is going to benefit from having designers. Now, all this talk about the role of design managers in managing designers brings up the question is design management also design leadership because these two words exist and uh, they're pretty prolific in literature so you can always find these two words design leadership design management and they actually are not the same thing and i think that's very important to understand these two are not the same thing they have a lot to do with each other so here I've put them on this slide to, for us to see if there is a difference between them. <clears throat> and I think there is a difference between them. So the top one here is design leadership and the bottom one is design management. You can already see that design management, <clears throat> sorry, um, 
here deals mostly with process management. The processes that happen when design work is done. And then design leadership, that is a term that actually refers only to the vision of the design. So where is it going? What do we want to do with it? So they're quite different things. And uh, I think if I had to do one of the two roles professional, I'd much rather be the design leader than the design manager, because I hate accounting and stuff like that. And the design manager does the design process. So there is a lot of budget stuff. There is a lot of Excel files and all those awful things. Whereas the design leadership on top here, where you manage the vision, that's just all about inspiring people and reminding everybody what wonderful thing we're actually trying to create. So that is the difference between design leadership and design management. I won't go through the, the words here on the page because I think I've, I've made the point, but you will be getting this presentation so you can look it up uh, later if you like. Now, perhaps we would like something that we can put on the wall in front of us in case we ever become design managers. The four different things that go on in the life of a design manager, the four pillars on which design management as a profession is based. And there are these four things here. So when you sign up for a job as a design manager, you will be expected to be able to do these four things. They are project management, design itself, strategy, and so-called supply chain techniques. Right, here comes the next onslaught of big things. Now I'm going to take you through these four pillars and explain each one in detail and what they are. Project management. I think that is a term that is intuitively understandable. And I hope that some of you may have done project management or may have, uh, may have had it here at the university perhaps. It's my observation that a lot of designers go into project management. And the good news is you can be a project manager at a lot of companies that don't necessarily use designers. So you don't need to have designers to be a project manager, even if you are a designer. <clears throat> now, project management means you're dealing with time management. You're, doing, you're dealing with the scope of activity and the scope of involvement that your team is uh, required to do with scope. We are we basically we're talking about how far do we go in this team? Is this team going to make a full functioning prototype? Or is this team only going to make five sketches till Thursday and then that's it for us with this project and we're moving on to a different one. So that's the scope. Then there is the budget to deal with. You will have a budget to deal with whether it's your own company or whether you are employed as a design manager. Your design uh, department has a budget. It's negotiated regularly sometimes quarterly, sometimes annually, but it's you who's doing that negotiation. And you might say things like, yeah, uh, all the SolidWorks licenses are expiring this year. We need new licenses for SolidWorks and we have new staff members. So we need 16 of these things this year, not just 12. So these kinds of stipulations come from the design manager and project management aspects. And then there's the actual quality of the work that is done. You might expect that we will, of course, always defend the quality of the people we are working with, but perhaps it's necessary not to. Because as a design manager, you are actually responsible for the output of your team. And if they did terrible work, then uh, it's much better for you if you apologize and say, this wasn't very good, uh, rather than stick up for it and say, no, no, it's perfect. It's great. <laughs> yeah, I hope you see that, that point. <clears throat> um, before we go on to the next pillar of design management, I'll quickly talk about uh, the, the history of project management, because project management uh, is an interesting thing in itself. And you can imagine 
that it started a long time ago because people have been doing projects ever since there have been people. So we know, for example, that hmm, architects in Rome, such as Vitruvius, um, were themselves uh, project managers and they wrote long books and uh, notes on project management and how to, how to run an architecture project. <clears throat> it took almost 2000 years though, until this person came along, Henry Gant, and I imagine you are recognizing his surname, Gant, from the Gant charts that you have hopefully already been doing. And he, he came upon this thought that, hey, we could do pictures that help us do our time management. So he's the first person to come up with charts, the so-called Gant charts, <coughs> to help in project management. And then in the 20th century, things really took off with project management. And uh, <clears throat> the US Navy, after the Second World War, started making their own uh, planning graphics and things like that. I suppose it took a whole war for them to realize that it's good to draw pictures to, to understand project management. And a lot of other different graphic solutions to project management were then produced, heaps and heaps of them. I'll show you a cloud of them in a few minutes here. But they all work on the same structure. And this is pretty much a project management structure that we see here. Um, if you follow the arrows, <clears throat> you see that this is basically like a string that makes a loop. It goes around. I hope you can see my cursor here. So we start at the initiation of the project. And then we're moving into the planning and design stage. And then we're going into executing, which could mean that we're beginning to make jigs and prototypes and machines. And maybe we're going back into planning and design, which is why these arrows here look the way they do. And then eventually we can finally leave that stage, go into the monitoring and controlling of the production process, and then it's done and we're closing. So they all work like that. I think that's the most important thing for someone to know who, who needs to do project management. You always have this set up here on this page, no matter what model they're putting in front of you to use. And there are all sorts of crazy looking models and they all work like that green loop thing that I just showed you. So here's the thing called Prince 2. There are others called prism and iteration cycle and feedback loop and what have you. There is a wonderful new thing that came up about 15 years ago called the sustainability helix. Um, and this is all wonderful mumbo jumbo basically to, to help you express how you work. Uh, there are all these out there. This is just a, a part of, of what's out there. I'm, I, I'm, I would imagine there is a new method every month. So uh, this one may already be an old one. But this just to say that uh, if you ever find yourself being a project manager of some capacity, there is hope. You have all these different processes and softwares that you could use and just get one of them and you're going to look good with it. So like I said, all boils down to this stuff. So no big deal. So that was only the first pillar. That was only the project management. This is my wife's phone going off in the back. She is leaving the building, just a room. <laughs> now, the next pillar of design management is ta -ta -ta, design, of course. Now, what is design? Can we actually define design? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I have, I have never thought of it myself until I came upon the need to prepare this lecture. And I was like, okay, what is design actually? And uh, it took me a while, but then I finally found this definition here. And I, I couldn't even find an author, but I think this is the perfect description. They're saying design is a specification of an object. We also know it could be a service manifested by an agent, which means somebody makes something, intended to accomplish goals, 
So clearly we are not doing this just for fun to see what happens. In a particular environment, yeah, we have our customer, we have our company, we have uh, our, our factory using a set of primitive components. I'm surprised that they're primitive, but yeah, in a way they are. And then we are satisfying a set of requirements that are subject to certain constraints. Wow, I mean, this is in one sentence what design is. Personally, I think it's beautiful. I, I could not improve on this and trust me, I've tried. I've been holding this lecture for almost 10 years and this is still the one that I go by it is to define what design is. If you had to define design to a space alien or to an engineer, which is maybe the same thing, this is what I would use. The third pillar of design management is strategy, a wonderful thing. Um, I have a friend actually, I might've talked about him before, who is a strategist and he, he studied design. He has a bachelor's degree in industrial design and a master's degree in industrial design. And now he's a strategist at a company called Carrefour, a French supermarket in China, which hilariously they pronounce Jaloufou there. And, um, my wife is laughing, she's from China, she remembers. Um, and he, he does the strategy for the supermarket and he finds it incredibly exciting. Perhaps it is. Uh, strategy, I found this official definition here in a, in a lexicon, is a high level plan to achieve one or more goals under conditions of uncertainty. That's what strategy officially is. And that's still true. I mean, this, this uh, quote may be 2000 years old or older, a lot older, but uh, that is what strategy still is. Um, now it's happening in a management context, obviously. In the management context, according to the Chandler, I love Chandler, you know that, uh, is the determination of basic long-term goals and objectives of an enterprise and the adoption of courses of action and the allocation of resources necessary for carrying out these goals. So really we're talking about three different things that the management context needs. Management means we are dealing with goals, we are dealing with methods and we're dealing with means, which could be money, could be machines, could be people, whatever it takes to get the job done. And that takes us to the fourth pillar. So we're 75% done with the long thing. Uh, supply chain techniques. Uh, a supply chain, I would imagine you can imagine what that is. It sounds a bit like where the products come from, where the materials come from, but it's more than that. A supply chain, is a whole system of organizations, people, technology, activities, information, and resources involved in moving a product or service from supplier to customer. And that may well mean that we have that whole universe of things, organization, people, technology, repeated several times over within the process of actually making just the one product. So it's pretty big. If you cannot read the bits here in this graphic, don't worry. They're not meant to be read. Uh, I'm just putting that graphic in to show that supply chain is a big thing and has many arrows in it. Now, how do we designers actually connect to the supply chain? I mean, the supply chain sounds like something you deal with if you have a telephone on your desk and you run trucks and containers from uh, uh, shipping harbor to supermarkets. But we have a role in this as designers. The first thing that we do is we, we are in the business of demand generation as designers. We designers are making sure that people want stuff because when we are done with a product, it's better looking, more desirable, works better, is more environmentally friendly and so on. So we, we are the motor 
of supply chain, if you will, because we make people want stuff. That's our role in the supply chain as designers. Um, we are clearly having an influence also. We are having an influence on any manufacturing processes, any costs, any quality, and any lead time that is happening in the process of creating a product. We're having that influence because when we are putting something forward as a design proposal, it's going to change the way everything works in the company. I think a lot of designers are underestimating just how much of an impact their work has on the entire company. Like I'll never forget my, my very first internship uh, in industry where I was designing in landscape boots. So this was a company just outside New York and they were building roller hockey skates. Roller hockey skates, you probably know what they are. So you have these leather boots and they're strapped on two chassis with four wheels and they're used by people playing hockey in arenas. And I thought at the time, oh, these leather boots are looking so old fashioned. I'm going to make some nice snazzy plastic ones and they're going to look fantastic. And I put all these pictures on the wall of nice skate boots that looked a bit more like skiing boots. And they were in all different colors and they were made basically from injection or rotation molded plastic, just like skiing boots. And all these people came through, the director came through, the marketing guy came through, the engineers came through, and you should have seen the excitement. They were like, oh my God, this is going to be so hard to do. Everything will change for us. We can't afford this. Uh, we can't make that at the quality the customer expects. This will take us 10 years to get ready. So I, I didn't expect just how much uh, a few drawings on the wall can cause in terms of excitement. And uh, even when I started toning it down a little bit, or a lot rather, and st stuck to the leather boots that they were using, they still told me, yeah, you know, that bit of plastic there, that's too much. We, we have no time to put that in now. So keep in mind, when you're putting forward a design proposal, you're making a pretty big difference to the work of everybody else you're working with in that company. Well, then uh, to move on to point three here, um, we are having an effect on the manufacturing, on the transportation, on uh, regulations, on laws. Yeah, that's pretty much like point two, isn't it? Yeah, I should change that. <laughs> anyway, uh, you see now that uh, we designers actually have a lot to do with the supply chain even if it's only that we are um, yeah, having an impact on it through our work. Let's look a little bit at design management and its history because it hasn't just come out of nowhere. Design history as everything has had a beginning. And you've probably heard about this man here before. This is Peter Behrens. Uh, who was an architect in Berlin. And he was actually, he later worked for AEG and built AEG's corporate identity. That pretty much made him the world's first industrial designer by the account of some people. And uh, he started to make industrial design uh, something that can be managed with design management. And there were all these different organizations in the first part of the 20th century that started to use design management. So AEG with Peter Behrens was one of the first. Then came the Bauhaus, which is of course known to you. There was the British Design Council called the Council of Industrial Design in 1944, but these days they're called the British Design Council. They had scores of people working on making design management happen and writing books on it. The Deutsche Werkbund was an interesting phenomenon which also wrote a few things on design management. The Italian company Olivetti, led by Ettore Sozzas at the time, uh, had a few interesting things to say about design management. Peter Behrens again. And this man, Walter Pepti, 
who founded the Aspen Institute in Colorado. So this is basically the whole literature base. If, if you want to write maybe a master's thesis on design management or uh, even want to do a PhD on it one day, these would be the places to look for the, the basics of design management in literature. Right, we're almost done. Uh, there's just one final and pretty important thing we need to talk about, and that is uh, intellectual property. Because design management is dealing with intellectual property, which is about protecting ideas and protecting creations. And maybe you have seen this before, but it's probably always good to see this again. Uh, the different types of intellectual property protection that you can have. There are six types, and there are these here. There are the patents, and there are copyrights, so-called industrial design rights, not industrial design rights, but industrial design rights. Uh, there are the trademarks, the trade dress, and the trade secrets. And I'm going to explain a little bit about them now. A patent, patent is a word that is very often used wrong. Uh, most people who don't understand intellectual property will say, yeah, we patent that. Or, yeah, we have a patent on that. No, you may not, because there are many different ways in which you can pretend, uh, protect stuff. And patent is a specific thing that only does a certain kind of protection. So here's what a patent will do. A patent will grant the inventor and nobody else, just the inventor, the exclusive right to make you sell and import an invention for a limited period of time. Now let's look at this in detail here. What we are saying is only the person who invented something is allowed to use it in order to either make it or use it or sell it um, and it's only going to be valid for a limited period of time. That's between 16 and 20 years in most places. The other thing that happens with a patent is that public disclosure will immediately happen with your invention. That means there's going to be a description of your invention and there's going to be pictures of your invention and everybody can see it. It's going to be at the patent office and these days that's searchable by a computer, of course. You can just do it from the comfort of your own home, go through an American or European patent office and uh, look at every single invention that is filed there as a patent and read the description of how it works in every detail and see pictures of it. And the good thing is, if it is no longer valid, you can just use it. And the other thing is that the invention, uh, the only kind of invention that can be patented uh, is either a product or a process. And this isn't listed here and it needs to be uh, suitable for serial production. So we can't patent a, a handmade sculpture, for example, but we could very well patent <laughs> A sculpture that can be made in a factory that can do some very unusual things. So that's a patent. The other thing that is out there is a so-called copyright. And a copyright is like the, the, the little sibling of the patent. It's a much easier thing to get. Uh, it's much, much quicker and it doesn't protect you quite as well. A copyright it gives the creator of an original piece of work. Now, this is already different from an invention, as you notice, the exclusive rights for a limited time. So here we're talking about something that isn't really an invention, isn't really a revolutionary idea of any kind. It's just a little, maybe a little graphic or something that's two dimensional perhaps. So this, this applies to creative things to intellectual work, to artistic work, you know, books, logos, cartoons, uh, teddy bears, that kind of thing. That can get a copyright. 
and it cannot cover ideas as such. It cannot cover information. It can only cover the way in which something is expressed. So for example, if, you, if you're looking at a cartoon character, Asterix and Obelix, Asterix and Obelix clearly have a copyright on them. And they are these funny little uh, characters from France. Have we invented French people? No, we have just made a depiction of how they could have looked 2000 years ago. And that's why they get a copyright and not a patent. Let's look at this famous thing here, the industrial design right. That is so strange to look at. Like I said, the industrial design right has nothing to do with industrial design. Uh, it's, it's a coincidence. This is about design rights for industry. And it is almost a bit like a copyright because we're not actually protecting uh, an idea or an invention, but we're protecting the way something looks. But contrary to a copyright, this actually covers things that can be three-dimensional, such as the three Adidas stripes. We know it's an Adidas shoe because it has the three stripes. And Adidas has an industrial design right protection on these things. Then we have the trademark. I'm sure you've all heard of the trademark before. Trademark officially serves to uh, identify a product or service. Uh, it has a certain look to it, and that is, that's what we protect, the look of something that helps recognize a certain yeah, product, if you will. So the typical example here is the Coca-Cola bottle, which has both a trademark on the logo and on the shape of the bottle. There is another thing that exists in quite a few countries called the trade dress. The trade dress is basically a little sticker of endorsement um, that can go onto a product. It's a, a seal of quality, of a certain kind of compliance with something. In America, you have, for example, that, that uh, sticker there. Whenever you have uh, dairy products like cheese or milk, that is made organically, then they can have that sticker on them. And everybody knows, ah, it's all biologically grown and organic. So that's what a trade dress is, uh, kind of a, a symbol for something, a symbol for a certain quality. And then in the end, we have the trade secrets, uh, secrets which I find are very interesting. There's this famous example of Kentucky Fried Chicken, I don't even know if there is a Kentucky Fried Chicken in Sweden. I hope you know what it is if there isn't one. Um, so this is a, a chain from the US that is famous for their fried chicken. And there is an interesting thing about them. The interesting thing is that they have never protected the way they make their fried chicken. Now, how is that? Why didn't they protect the very thing that their basis uh, of business uh, anchors in. And it's very simple. For one, it may be that perhaps they aren't using a process that is innovative. Perhaps they're just frying chicken the way chickens have been fried for 2000 years or longer. But that's not actually true. They are using something special. They have a formula because as you might know, Kentucky Fried Chicken is a fried chicken that stays very crispy and yummy even on a long drive home, as you have in America often. And you can still eat it nice and crispy two hours later. Nobody knows how that's done. And that's because they have kept it a trade secret. So those, that, that, that crunchy breading on those chickens, nobody else knows how that's done. And that's because the recipe is kept in a safe at the company. And they have had that safe for 110 years. And nobody will hopefully ever know how that's done. Now, why would they do such a foolhardy thing and not protect that trade secret? Well, it's very simple. If you, re if you remember the bit about the patents, you'll remember that a patent expires after 16 to 20 years. 
And then what do you do? Everybody will know how you've done it because the patent means the public gets a description of the recipe. And that's exactly what they don't want. I mean, it's fine if you don't think your business is going to last longer than 16 years, but we see here in the case of Kentucky Fried Chicken that they've been around for over 100. So in their case, it clearly made sense not to ever go public, even as a patent, and just keep the, keep the thing secret. And that ties into design management because as a design manager, you will be the one who needs to know these things. Yeah. So now we're at the end of this long lecture and I hope you've found that useful. I'm also going to make that available to you uh, as a video. And I suggest we take a 15 minute break and I'll see you at uh, 10.30 for the, the next part.